sociologically, in reaction to the Catholic Church's official defense of a traditionalist position on gender issues, and a singularly obsessive focus on sexual moral issues, one can observe throughout the Catholic world a dual process of female secularization and erosion of the church's authority and sexual morality. Perhaps for the first time, in the accumulative waves of modern secularization, women have left the church in large numbers, most dramatically throughout Europe, but increasingly also throughout North America and incipiently, but very, very significantly, in Latin America in a way that should sound alarm bells. Female secularization is probably the most significant factor in the drastic secularization of Western European societies since the 1960s and in the radical rupture of European Christian religion as a chain of memory. The male intelligentsia left the church in the 18th century, the male bourgeoisie in the early 19th century, and the male proletariat in the late 19th and 20th century. But as long as women remain in the church, children were baptized and raised as Christians, and there was a future for the church and the possibility of a religious revival and a reversal of secularization. Once women begin to abandon massively the church, as has happened and continues to happen since the 1960s, the future of the church begins to look sociologically much bleaker. Equally, equally crucial and of grave societal relevance is, in my view, the drastic secularization of sexual morality. Increasing numbers of practicing Catholics are disobeying the injunctions of the Catholic hierarchy and following their own conscience on most issues related to sexual morality. Moreover, there is increasing evidence from public opinion polls in Europe, North America, and Latin America that young Catholic adults are explicitly dissociating their sexuality and their religiosity, claiming that religion has absolutely no influence upon their attitudes towards sexuality. We are witnessing, on the one hand, a church hierarchy which evinces an almost obsessive focus in defending traditional sexual morality, and on the other, on the other hand, a majority of Catholic faithful in the secular world who not only ignore the moral injunctions of the hierarchy, but feel increasingly comfortable dissociating their religion and their sexuality. One must wonder how far this radical dissociation of private sexuality from religion and even from morality can go and where it may lead. In my view, it is leading to a radical secularization of the private sphere of individual consciousness that parallels the secularization of economics in the 18th century and of politics in the public sphere in the 19th century. In my judgment, the uncritical defense of traditional sexual mores and a wholesale critique of the modern sexual revolution in the name of natural law principles, one that fails to recognize the providential sign of the times in modern secular moral developments grounded in the sacred dignity of the human person will be counterproductive and will not be able to play a critical prophetic role vis-a-vis -vis some of the most questionable trends. Only a church that recognizes and embraces the validity of the core modern moral developments as part of the providential signs of the times can play a critical prophetic role vis-a-vis -vis immoral and anomic secular trends. Finally, the scandal on of the clerical sexual abuse of children. Perhaps in no other area has the gap between societal and church morality been more publicly visible than in the revelations of clerical child sexual abuse that have, radic rack, have racked so dramatically the Catholic Church country after country in recent years. The scandal has taken everywhere the same threefold form. First, there was the initial shock and the scandal at the public revelation of the clerical sexual abuse of children. Then there followed the even greater shock in a scandal at the revelation of the widespread and persistent episcopal and curial praxis of cover-up. Then there follow 
the dismay at the totally inappropriate character of so many public statements and rationales offered by Episcopal and Vatican authorities. The Church, of course, has always considered child sexual abuse a grave moral sin. But it has shown difficulties understanding the extent to which child sexual abuse is not just a grave moral offense, but has become a sacrilegious moral and legal crime, precisely in supposedly sexually free willing and licentious contemporary societies. The Canadian moral theologian, Daniel Sear, has captured most poignantly the emerging gap in societal and church morality. The Catholic Church appears to be caught in a deadly cultural crossfire. The Church is widely mocked for its attempt to resist the ongoing liberalization of sexuality. At the same time, the Church has become the focus for intense public outrage insofar as it is perceived to be the showcase for the one form of sexual transgression that contemporary culture, with all its free will in sexual transgressiveness, decisively condemns as beyond the moral pale. Nothing, perhaps, reveals as clearly the gap between societal and church morality than the fact that it has taken the church so long to understand the child sexual abuse, which was a relatively widespread but ignored practice in the past across societies and institutions, has become a modern societal taboo, and that modern societies have learned to react with the same scandalous shock and with a kind of moral outrage, which according to Durkheim, is the typical societal response to the sacrilegious profanation of any taboo. It was secular society and public opinion that were ahead of the church on this moral issue, while the church appeared to be lagging behind and dragging its feet. Fortunately, the papacy of Benedict XVI put an end to the ambiguities of the Vatican's response and initiated a new policy of zero tolerance towards abusing priests, full collaboration with civil authorities in the investigation of any criminal allegation, repeated gestures of contrition and public supplication of forgiveness for the clerical wrongdoing and for the serious harm caused to the victims, and personal encounters and open dialogue with the victims and their families. There are solid grounds for hope that the words of the scandal may be behind us. But what are the moral lessons which the church appears to have drawn from the disastrous historical episode? One important, but in my view insufficient, lesson appears to be that the church, being in the world, was caught up like everybody else and like all worldly institutions in the whirlwind of the sexual revolution, the countercultural experiments, and the general anomic attitudes and deviant behavior that became seemingly endemic in liberal Western societies in the 1960s and the 1970s. This appears to be the selective lesson reinforced by the two reports presented to the US Conference of Catholic Bishops by the research team of the Jan Jay College of Criminal Justice. The findings are very relevant and demonstrate that the phenomenon of clerical sexual abuse was indeed a historical episode in that there was a drastic and persistent increase in the number of incidents of sexual abuse of minors from the early 60s to the late 70s which was uniform across all dioceses and regions, regions in the United States, and was followed by an equally precipitous, consistent, and uniform decline from the early 80s to the early 90s. Paradoxically, revelations of the abuse only began to appear slowly in the early 1980s, two decades after the endemic abuse had begun, and at a time when the decline was already well underway. The church hierarchy appeared to be relieved by the conclusive findings of the reports that contrary to widespread public opinion, there was no demonstrable correlation between clerical sexual abuse and the priestly rule of celibacy, nor any clear unambiguous correlation 
between the noted homosexual tendencies among candidates to the priesthood and the sexual abuse of children. Since the homosexual tendencies in seminaries increased significantly in the 1990s, while the rate of abuse continued to decline throughout the decade and remained persistently low into the first decade of the 21st century. The report findings seem to confirm the impression that the causes of the epidemic were social and external rather than internal to the church, a clear case of secular moral degeneration contaminating some rotten apples within the church. The lesson which the church appears to have drawn heartily from the scandal is the need for greater vigilance, reforming its seminaries, putting even a stricter emphasis on the doctrine of celibacy and on the separation and protection of seminarians and priests from corrupting secular immoral influences. The model appears to be increasingly that of a pure clerical church in an impure secular world. The lesson could have been different if the reports and the ecclesiastical reading of the findings had paid greater attention to the obvious fact that the decline of the clerical sexual abuse was equally due to social causes that were external rather than internal to the church since the decline started and continued uninterruptedly well before the church began to respond to the crisis, instituting its own internal reforms. The single most important cause in the sudden and rapid decline of clerical sexual abuse was a change in secular societal morality that led to the criminalization of the sexual abuse of women and children. The practice, which now began to be viewed as aberrant, had been hitherto widespread, ignored, and concealed in most social settings. The main carriers of this secular moral revolution were women and feminists who made society morally aware that the widespread sexual abuse of women at home, at work, and in public places was morally unacceptable and could not continue with impunity. The elevation of the sacred dignity of children and their protection from adult, predominantly male sexual abuse was primarily also the moral consequence of the same feminist movement which helped to raise the sacred dignity of women. In my humble sociological view, it behooves the church to discern carefully the providential signs of the times in such secular moral developments. After all, feminism might not be the main problem facing the church. On the contrary, a proper response to the feminist challenge may in fact be a solution to many of the contemporary problems facing the church.